doing? Hey, those of you who are out there getting snacks and coffee, I think that's wonderful that you're still socializing. But seriously, we are going to have worship in here if you want to join us. <laughs> if you can hear the sound of my voice, just start walking towards it. I, I promise it's a safe zone. Just come on in here and worship. Just like your kids in school, they're ignoring you. I know, I know, they do that. They really do that. Um, a lot of the uh, announcements are repeats. They're the things that we always do. We've got our uh, gay, joyous, and free meeting. We've got theology on tap, the prayer group. Um, the kayak safety classes, that's a relatively new announcement. I talked about that last week. Biggest thing is, is just watch the dates that are there in the program. If you want to uh, register for that, there is a pre-registration that is required, and the dates are all listed in the program. Uh, the other thing I really want to mention again, uh, please sign up for reading and hospitality food. The lists are out there in the vestibule, so when you feel like you can go get a refill of your coffee or get another snack, think about the fact that somebody brought that snack. And maybe you could sign up to bring a snack sometime, and that would be awesome. Okay? Um, as soon as we have a piano player, I think I'm almost ready to go. Karen, do you have an announcement? Great, because I don't have a piano player, and so I might as well have an announcement while I'm waiting for that. Sherry asked me to share with you some of what happened at General Conference these last two weeks. You may have been following it on um, on her posts or on the web or whatever, but uh, I told her I wasn't sure that I would do a very good job about this because I'm really ticked off with the church. Um, the United Methodist Church, the good news is um, they didn't change anything in the discipline as it has to do with human sexuality homosexuality and all that. That's good news in that if it had changed, it would have been more restrictive. Um, the good news is that they um, passed a motion by a vote, I think maybe 23 votes, to refer everything that had to do with sexuality to a special commission that the bishops are putting together, made up of a diverse group from around the world. Um, to discuss and to bring back, possibly in two years, to a special general conference recommendations around how the church is going to relate to LGBTQ folks. Um, general conference was probably this time the ugliest and most divisive that it's ever been. But there are reasons. There are many reasons for that. One of the one of the reasons that I see is that uh, we are a global church. 30% of the delegates who were there are from Africa. And in most of the countries in Africa, homosexuality is illegal. Therefore, when we talk about changing the discipline to accept homosexuals into our church, they're gonna say absolutely not. And they are um, funded, directed, and influenced by the evangelical part of our denomination here, who are encouraging them to say no. So. That's all the bad news. The good news is we still have our church, the village. Um, we still can be welcoming. We still have open minds, open hearts, and open doors where some of our churches don't. Um, at one point, I, I decided that I was leaving the church as a pastor, and then I realized I'd lose my benefits. <laughs> still, morally and ethically, I'm struggling with that. and. Um, I'm grateful that this church is also connected to the UCC church, so that's not um, something that I have to do necessarily, but uh, we need to keep our church in prayer. It would be very interesting, it would be the first time in our history that there would be a special general conference called between regular four-year general conferences. If this work is taken seriously, I think it could be wonderful because I believe that the truth will set us free and that in the end, people will witness to the love of God and not to narrow-mindedness and fear. Well, that having been said, why don't you go up and stand and join us in worshiping. Our first song is Here I Am, Lord.
this run, and I don't think you could very well run if you're sitting down.
through your prayer this morning that we would love you with everything. That we would love you more than all of our menial possessions. More than all of our mediocre pastimes. More than we would love our cars and our homes and and everything else that you've given us in the first place. It all comes from you. And we should praise you and thank you for, for allowing us to have it for just a little while. But you will have you forever. Let us, let us love you that way. And let us show that love to each other, to every person that we might see on the street. Just give them a little smile. Just look them straight in the eye and just let them see in us the love that you have for them, the love that you have for us. Let it shine, Lord. Let us live for you. Live like we mean it. Live like we understand the love that you have for us that is so unfathomable. But it's got to start somewhere, Lord. Let it start right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Now is the time in our service that we remember who we are as a community of faith by reading our village statement. It will be printed on the screen behind us. It's also printed in your program if you'd like to read along. We are the village church. When we gather in community, we remember that God is with us. We know that we are imperfect people who make mistakes. We give thanks that God loves us anyway. In this community, we practice patience, compassion, and forgiveness. But when we leave this gathering, we go out to share God's healing love with the broken world. We are Jesus' instruments of hope in our world. We are followers of Jesus, and we can change the world. Kids who are dismissed, big kids who are welcome to stay put. I'll be reading our scripture today from the message paraphrase from the Acts of the Apostles. <coughs> The next day, a meeting was called in Jerusalem. The rulers, religious leaders, religion scholars, Annas the chief priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, everybody who was anybody was there. They stood Peter and John in the middle of the room and grilled them. Who put you in charge here? What business do you have doing this? With that, Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, let loose. Rulers and leaders of the people if we have been brought to trial today for helping a sick man put under investigation regarding this healing, I'll be completely frank with you. We have nothing to hide. By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one you killed on a cross, the one God raised from the dead, by means of his name, this man stands before you healthy and whole. Jesus is the stone you masons threw out, which is now the cornerstone. Salvation comes no other way. No other name has been given or will be given to us by which we can be saved. Only this one. They couldn't take their eyes off them. Peter and John standing there so confident, so sure of themselves. Their fascination deepened when they realized these two were laymen with no training in scripture or formal education. They recognized them as companions of Jesus, but with the man right before them, seeing him standing there so upright, so healed, what could they say against that?
How you doing in spreading the good news? This is not a rhetorical question. <laughs> How are you doing in spreading the good news? How's it going? Good, good. Good? Good, good. Good? Good. Excellent. Yeah, I was just thinking, this is not in the script, but I was just thinking uh, back to, I was in the PCC, which is the Parochial Church Council. This is back when I was in London. And uh, so that was like the elders team for the church. And um, the, the vicar, because that's what we had in the Anglican Church. The vicar came to the PCC and he said, I'm thinking next of doing a Bible study on the Acts of the Apostles. And I said, that's fabulous. Not. <laughs> and he says, what do you mean? And I said, well, Michael, think about it. We have just done this whole Bible study on prayer. And we've got people who are getting together to pray. We've got people who are taking prayer seriously. We've got people who are going out praying for people. Can you imagine what's going to happen if we study the Acts of the Apostles? When people get risen from the dead? <laughs> he said, oh, Rosie, you're so silly. <laughs> <laughs> so have you had opportunities recently to share what Jesus is doing in your life? Again, not a rhetorical question. Yeah? Oh. Anyone like to share? Yeah, Amy. <clears throat> Yesterday, um, I went to my local Legion Hall because my father and I are both veterans. And there was about 50 people because there were some advocates there to help people that are having trouble getting the benefits that they need. Right. And there was a few families that have a uh, brother, sister, son coming back from Afghanistan with PTSD symptoms. Right. And I work for Harbor, and we now have a PTSD group and stuff like that. So I was letting them know that there's help for them to make them understand what their child or friend is going through and what, you know, what areas we can help them with to get them help the help that they're going to need because the suicide rate right now is very high. Yes. And so Jesus has put you in a place where you can use your experience empowered by your knowledge to reach other people. That's awesome. Anybody else? You know, the, the biggest thing I loved about that was yesterday. I love that. It wasn't like three months ago I was talking to somebody. Yes, Jackie. Um, for several months I've been drawn to this uh, the Greek Orthodox Church downtown, and uh, I've just been praying for it um, when I go to the prayer room at the third building during the week. Okay. So I ended up, um, I had a dream all night, just kept dreaming about this church, and I, I was like praying for it in my dream, and so I, I felt led to go there, and I was welcomed in, and um, Father Larry um, invited me into his office, and we had this open, candid conversation about um, being gay and being a Christian. And he um, said that he wished that uh, there would be more conversations like this and that he hopes to have some in the future. And, Excellent. Um, that, that his understanding is it's just changing. His brother is gay and he has some gay folks in the congregation. And, um, so it's kind, of, it's kind of cool. It's much easier to have prejudicial opinions about gay people if you don't know any. Right? Yeah. It's when you, once you start realizing they don't have three heads and vicious teeth, <laughs> like they don't bite or stalk children, or, you know, once you realize those things, it's much easier to go, okay, and, and to realize, when I, when I got kicked out of the church, Grace, um, one of the things that made me sad is that all I was at that point was gay. They, they lost sight of my intelligence, my wit, my compassion. It's like I was simply gay and I needed to be gone. We've come a long way. And I, I came out to them because I was, um, I'd met somebody. And now we've been together for 15 years, so that was pretty awesome. I think they thought it was gonna be like a phase that I would go through. I'm liking the phase that I can stick with. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, oh, I, oh, thank you, Trevor. Um, my fr my one of my friends, her daddies do abuse her a lot, and like, I'm all, he, whenever she do apparently do something wrong, her dad would always like, hit her and stuff. And one time she always got thrown off a balcony. Oh. And like, this wasn't that long ago, and I'm all, I prayed for her every, almost every day, and her dad got help through the school through her school. Excellent. How old are you, Trevor? Thirteen. Thirteen year olds know how to do this. Yes, Rachel. <laughs> Job. My sister, my sister, had cancer. You had a cancer? She um, went live with Christ. Mm. She said she died, some of them had fallen off the pulse. They don't believe in certain Christians, so they don't follow the rest of them. Me either. Oh, that's it. I went to a Joyce Meyer conference Friday. to see him work. 
But God will always show up if you with humble heart invite him in. So, that's good news, right? <laughs> right there. Yeah. You know, uh, Corrie Ten Boom, who was, I'm, and I'm sorry, I'm really off track on my um, sermon right now. <laughs> Poor Patty. Uh, Corrie Ten Boom, who was somebody who was in, uh, what, in the Holocaust. When she came out of the prison camp, she, she would talk about, you don't stamp the ticket till you get on the train. You know, if you worry about God not showing up, it's like saying, I don't know whether my ticket is valid. Right? You don't get it stamped until you get on the train. Right? You have to take that step of faith into things. So, I was in Atlanta last weekend. We went to visit a former student. I am in the fortunate position to have had many students in my life who affectionately call me Ma. Or, you know, some version of that. And um, so we, we got a text in February to say that we could become grandmothers. And it was a student who lives in Atlanta now, and so we had made a plan to go and visit our first grandbaby. And unfortunately, as we're standing in Detroit Airport, and I text and say, I'm really looking forward to seeing you, uh, I got a text back to explain that a medical emergency had pulled this student back to Toledo, and she is currently looking after her mom in Toledo Hospital. We'll get back to that in a moment. But so Linda and I traveled to Atlanta and had a great time, but instead of visiting with people, we got to see the Museum of Human and Civil Rights and also the birthplace of Martin Luther King. We heard the soundtrack of his preaching. Gosh, I wish I could have that kind of authority. I have a dream. You know, probably if I'm not going to have that kind of authority in English accent, there's probably a close second. <laughs> We saw photos of him standing up for civil rights, standing in the lines at the front of those marches, intense pictures of him sitting in prison, and then photos of the assassination site. I brought back a book of Martin Luther King's sermons because I find his oratory so inspiring. I wish that I could speak with that level of mindfulness and intelligence and diligence to God's word and also compassion for people. So I bought a book of sermons and I did actually think about last week, you know, maybe just reading one of his sermons, but I can do the voice. So <coughs> when I look at someone like Martin Luther King, I wonder what I have to offer the world. I wonder whether you, any of you have felt intimidated like that by someone. I mean, to be honest, some of you might feel intimidated like that by me, right? Well, I'd do better talking about Jesus if I was like Rosie, or I was like Jackie, or I was like Neil and I could play the piano or something, or I was like Todd and I could heal dogs and animals and things. I'd be better at this Jesus thing if I could do what somebody else did. And here's the good news. Jesus does not, I'm going to say this slowly, Jesus does not require or expect us to be anything but the person that we are in order to be witnesses. I'm going to say it again because it's important, right? Jesus does not require or expect us to be anything but the person that we are in order to be witnesses. In fact, it's good that I am not like Todd. Because I reach people that Todd doesn't. Science, forget it. They've got a Christian for that. Right? 13-year-old boys, they've got a Trevor for that. Right? 
it's important that you are who you are because God has placed you in a position to do what you do. And the only thing we ever have to feel bad about is if we don't do us. So what's your story? I used to think that it would be nice to have a bolder testimony, you know. When I was a mass murderer and I discovered Jesus. You always have to have a northern accent for that kind of thing. Ah, I discovered Jesus when I was a mass murderer in prison. And the chaplain came to me and he says, now look here, lass, you need to straighten up your act. <laughs> See, that's a great testimony to be able to give, right? Can anyone relate to that? You, you'd like it if there was a bigger story? Like you feel like people with the... Like when I was saved from human trafficking. Right, that's a big story, right? You know, my story of coming to faith was started at a school Christian club and we went for a week away in a place called Cornwall. It just doesn't sound very big. I came to Jesus on a Bible school camp. <laughs> <laughs> this boy stood up in front of everybody and he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only blood so that those who ever believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I said, Oh, that's me, I need that. <laughs> right? It's not that big, is it? Kind of normal. I was 12. So, big isn't the point. So, we're going to get to what the point is. From today's reading, it was a day. This is the chapter before. It was a day like any other day. The beggar was sat at a beautiful gate at the entrance to the temple. It was the three o'clock service. And Peter and John arrive. Beggar asks for money. And then the narrative changes. Suddenly, it's not a day like any other day because Peter and John don't have money. And in the words of the children's Bible song, Peter says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now back to the Bible version for a moment. It says, Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. As he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. And the song goes on to say, He went walking and leaping and praising God, walking and leaping and praising God in the name of Jesus Christ. Of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Interesting those details there, right? It was 3 p.m. service. Why is that important? I don't know. But details. God is in the details. It was the 3 p.m. service. He, he reached out to him by the right hand. Does it really matter which hand? Like, we've got a walking man here, right? But there's details. I think details like that are in the scripture so that you know that God is in the details. <coughs> Peter seizes on the opportunity in front of him and he says, hey, change your hearts and lives. Turn back to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then the Lord will provide a season of relief from the distress of this age and will send Jesus Christ. That's Acts 3, 19 and 20. By the end of the day, it says 5,000 people had been added to the company of disciples. But, consequences, Peter and John spent the night in prison. Martin Luther King spent, life, spent nights in prison. Sometimes the consequences are not necessarily ones we want to have. So, our reading for today starts the next day, and Peter and John are brought in front of the elders. Now, you'd think they know better, right? They brought in front of the leaders, elders, legal experts, and Caiaphas and Annas, who was the high priest, and others from the high priest family, John and Alexander. Details. It's not a generic story in the Bible. There are details. And Peter says, hey, if it's because a sick person
person was healed of here, you know, see, God, through Peter, turned everything upside down. These people aren't going to be able to come to the temple anymore and see that guy sitting there. Right? That image is forever changed. He's now up walking around. And it says in the Bible that that man had been crippled since birth. Hmm. And again, you'd think, like what happened to Peter last night? He was in prison, right? So you'd think he'd say, I'm going to play it safe now. All right? I'm going to just dial back a little on the dialogue. <laughs> Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, Leaders and of the people and elders, are we being examined today because something good was done for a sick person? A good deed that healed him? If so, then you and all the peace of people of Israel need to know that this man stands healthy before you because of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, this speech was so impressive, they couldn't take their eyes off him. They looked at them and they said they were so confident, so sure of themselves. And why? They recognized them as companions of Jesus. They weren't trained in any formal manner, nor were they educated, but they had a relationship with Jesus. And it was because of that relationship with Jesus and because of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that they had reached out to that man on that day by the right hand and said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That is the confidence that we're asked to be bold in today. I don't have more confidence. I might have more professional confidence as a result of completing my master's. But I don't have more confidence in God's ability as a result of my masters. I stand in the same faith that I acknowledged when I was 12 years old. When I bawled my eyes out because he talked about how Jesus was able to change it when we got things wrong. And I said, but I always get things wrong. <laughs> I've always been a sissy. <laughs> Someone once was asked if they were forgiven, they said, yes, not yet, and I will be. Because there's that sense of, yes, I'm forgiven. God has forgiven my past, but you know what, I still get, get it wrong right now, so I'm still in an ongoing manner being forgiven. We're going to celebrate that in the act of communion. And in the future, God knows that I won't always make the best choices, and he's even made provision for that. I'll get knocked down. Oh, I'll get up. <laughs> oh, sorry. And my confidence is in Jesus, in the risen Lord. So what's your story? What are the ways that you have seen God at work in your life? What are the areas where you need to see hope at this time? Going back to the young woman I spoke about earlier. I was there with her yesterday in the hospital room. Her mom is currently in a coma. And as I came home last night and I was rereading through the scripture and reminded of God's ability to cause somebody lame from birth to rise up and walk, I was challenged by my own uh, rationality that says, but yes, nowadays God has doctors for that. Right? Has anybody else ever felt like that? We kind of put it, and we put it in the hands of the doctors. My student educated me yesterday. She said the doctors come in and they ask her if there's any questions and she says it's not in your hands at the moment. Because she knows that if her mother gets up and walks again, it will be an act of Jesus. And she is standing in that. Uh, so I was challenged yesterday because I know 
that what God has done before, he can do again. And I want to I wanna ask that my brain get out of the way and allow God to work in and through me in the ways that he has done before. So I'm standing with my sister in Christ knowing that God did it before, he'll do it again. It takes courage to stand up, it does. It took courage for me to stand up to the church when I came out and to say to them, I have met someone that I love and I want to be with them. And they said, in that case, we need to leave our church. But here's the one thing you can do. You can do a Bible study with us and see where you're wrong. We'll give you a week to think about that. I went back to them a week later with no intention of leaving, that they also wanted me to leave my relationship. And I said, okay, here's the deal. I will if you will. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, I will do a Bible study with you to see where I'm wrong if you're willing to do the same Bible study to see where you're wrong. <laughs> but we're not wrong. God for them was in the box. The box that says, we've always thought about it this way, we will continue to think about it this way. But I tell you what, people that usually live in that box don't see people rising up and walking. They're kind of pharisaical about their belief. They say, we know the way God operates in our world and God cannot possibly love a gay person. Oh, I showed them. <laughs> <clears throat> so, the fear of being foolish can get in the way, the fear of being laughed at, the fear of being rejected, but God asks us to stand up for what we believe and what we believe is written in the book. If God uses disciples who he described, and there's various versions here, described as uneducated and inexperienced, ordinary men who were not well educated, uneducated common men, unlearned ignorant men, uneducated non-professionals, illiterate and uneducated men, depending on the version you go to of the Bible, those are some of the ways that's talked about. Then God can use any one of us not because of what we know, but because of who we know. So, there is an advertisement at the end of this sermon today. Wanted, unschooled, ordinary people who have spent time with Jesus. It's the same criteria of service that was in place for the disciples whose stories were told in the Acts of the Apostles. I want to invite you, this is, this is a different kind of response to the sermon, but I want to invite you uh, to just close your eyes. And I want to invite you that if you would like uh, just to be a little bolder in who you are, <coughs> just to put your hand up, and we're just going to pray. God, you see, you see us now, you know us now, you know all of our fears, our insecurities, and you know who you have made us to be. And Lord, I want to pray that by your Holy Spirit, in this time, you would fill us anew and afresh in such a way to embolden us, to have eyes open to the opportunities that are in front of us. Let us see you as we interact with others. Let us hear your voice as we interact with others. Please, God, use our mouths, use our hands, use our hearts to reach this world that is hurting and in need of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Actually, they have a trap, Mom. They have a trouble. You should, you should, you should, you should.
person who usually makes it wasn't able to, and I couldn't find any at the store. So we have regular bread. Um, when you come forward, please come down this way to this aisle. You'll receive the bread and dip it in the cup, and then uh, return to your seats to this aisle or by the ramp in the aisle over at the end. At the Village Church, we celebrate open communion in that you don't have to be a member of this church or any other church to partake in the elements. We invite anyone who loves God to come and celebrate with us. When we gather around the table, we remember that Jesus uh, met with his disciples and told them how much he loved them and told them what they can expect from the world, which is much of what we can expect from the world. And he told them to go and witness, to go and talk about what they knew. He talked to them about how much he loved them and how much God loves the world. As, as uh, Rosie said, John 3.16, God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And so when we gather around the table, remember God's love for us, God's sacrifice for us, and the fact that we are God's hands and hearts and feet in this world. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you, and we thank you for this gift of bread and juice, wine, that we partake of together, remembering that you are the one who keeps us going. May this bread and this wine be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we might be for the world the body of Christ, his hands, his feet, and his heart. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Eat this. This is my body which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me every time we eat together. And likewise, after the meal, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from this, all of you. This represents the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins for you and for many. Drink this in remembrance of me. I invite you to come forward um, and receive the elements. The whole family, prayers that Pam will rise up, walk, and uh, Trevor, praying for his friend Jolie and her dad, who's abusive. Pray for that to stop. Lisa uh, put in a prayer request. She a praise that she's moving into her own place June 1st, and thank you to all of those who helped make this happen. Yay. <laughs> Any other? Um, with it being the end of the school year, just prayers so for the kids who might be celebrating a little too much as they graduate. And yes. Yeah. About a couple of weeks ago, my mother's husband um, was caught stealing from Walmart and was thrown in jail and so she's lost her house and her animals and she's going through a really tough time right now so I hope that we all keep her in our prayers and in our thoughts as she tries to find her identity find where she fits now without these people taking care of her prayers for you too that because I'm sure that there will be times when you feel pulled to do more than maybe is healthy for you and all that sort of good stuff. Yes. For the children who were taken from their uh, father and stepfather this week, 13 year old who had been locked up in the basement. Oh and, yes. Yeah. Um, there are some things with that family that are just horrendous. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess uh, my prayer would be that the children's hearts could be opened particularly the 10-year-old boy who controls the two girls because the man is supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jackie? Chris is at home with a migraine and nausea. And so okay. Okay. Well, it's not okay. Yeah. But we'll pray. Yeah. Uh, for my co-worker, uh, Karen, who just found out she's got skin cancer, mm -hmm. she has surgery on the 7th on her back not quite sure how far down it's gone, so she will find out when they when she recovers how bad. Okay. Okay. 
uh, Linda's also having some issues, like Linda's my wife, she's also having some issues with her back and is probably more worried about it right now because we don't exactly know what's going on. So prayers for wisdom for doctors and or healing. I'm open to both. <laughs> yes, Paula. I also want to pray for my brother because we haven't seen him in like three months. Truck, your brother who? My brother James. We haven't seen him in three months and we want to come here and see us. Okay. Prayers for James. Okay. Um, I wish that my memory uh, trapped all of those. <laughs> but um, I'm going to pray an open prayer. Um, but I, I, I also want to encourage you who've heard different parts of that, to take these people home with you, um, to, to hold them, as we sang earlier, hold, those, hold your people in our hearts. So let's pray. God, we have in our, in our company right now and in our extended family, people who are wounded, people who are hurting, people who need an intervention on a divine level. God, we want to pray for healing for those who are hurting. We want to pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would flow into those who are in pain, whether it be physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. Lord, we want to ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would come present to those in need at this moment. And Lord, I pray again that you would open our ears and our hearts and our minds and our mouths to be your vehicles in this world. And in Jesus' name, you would help us see people rise up and walk again in this day. Amen. Now we're all going to stand if you are able and sing together our final song, which is Break Free. We also will be having the offering basket passed around. If you do not have uh, an offering for today or if you have donated online, please, we still invite you to touch the basket as you can. How was that? Was that good? Okay. I didn't realize that I was going to be doing that, but it came. There we go. Let's all break free.
spirit of love and joy and preach the good name of Jesus to all who will hear and all who will not hear and do so in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.